The 360 on Energy and Carbon, hosted by 360 Energy. On today's episode, we are joined by Cindy Bailey, Corporate Sustainability Officer, and Chris Henry, Fleet Director at Purolator. As Purolator's Corporate Sustainability Officer, Cindy is responsible for leading the development of Purolator's Environmental Sustainability Strategy, advancing policies and standards, managing environmental risks and opportunities, and improving Purolator's performance, disclosures, and reputation related to the environment and climate change. Currently, Cindy is leading the development of Purolator's Emissions Reduction Goals and Roadmap, which includes electrifying 60% of Purolator's last mile delivery vehicles by 2030. Chris Henry is a leader in electrification for Canada's leading parcel delivery company as the director of fleet for Purolator. He has held cross-functional roles in sales, marketing, procurement, change management, and continuous improvement. In his current role, Chris will draw upon his 25 plus year career to deliver on Purolator's greenhouse gas emission goals. Now let's get into the episode with Purolator. Great to be back. It's wonderful to be back, and I can't wait for this session because the, the first session we had with Pure Later was fantastic. So this is going to be, I'm setting the tone for how it's going to work for this second podcast. <laughs> Agreed. On today's episode, we are joined again by Cindy Bailey, Corporate Sustainability Officer, and Chris Henry, Fleet Director at Pure Later. Welcome back, Cindy and Chris. Thank you for having us. Happy to be back. Great to be here. Thank you. Okay, for this episode, I, I, I'm, I'm going to kick off. We're, we're going to get a little, perhaps dive in a little deeper with things. Hopefully, most of our, our listeners know that there are three scopes of GHGs, scope one, two, and three, very innovatively oh. named. One being direct energy consumption, two being indirect, and three being basically everything else. And I suppose what, what, I, what I, we're interested in, we, we have talked about Purolator doing uh, moving from fossil fuel trucks to electric trucks, so technically moving the emission, reducing scope one, but increasing scope two possibly. But I think what would be interesting, and, and Cindy touched on it in our first first episode about understanding where your emissions come from. So could you talk to us a bit about where your three scopes of emissions come from? Yeah, happy to. Thank you. Yeah, so we did we did talk quite a bit about that in the first episode, the the importance of really understanding your emissions and, and where they all come from. And, you know, that again, helping you to identify the, you know, the best opportunities for you to have an impact. So for us, I guess I would just start by saying, you know, as a transportation industry here in Canada, it is the second highest emitter of emissions. So, you know, at Purolator, we recognize that we have the opportunity to have a huge impact through the work that we're doing as part of the transition. The other point I would make is, you know, as we look at our overall emissions profile, more than 75% of all of our emissions come from a transportation related source. So again, focusing for us on our transportation is, is really the area that we can, we can generate a huge impact. So our scope three here at Purolator is we have many categories that make up our, our scope three. And again, I would just encourage everyone to you know, start to collect this information and, and measure this information and, and really get a sense of where your emissions are coming from. And don't be discouraged if the data that you have to begin with isn't entirely accurate. This is a process where, you know, you need to move through over many years to continue to improve the data accuracy for these different sources. So for us, we have a few areas within our scope three that make up the vast majority of our scope three emissions. The, the first one is subcontracted and third party ground, air and rail. So this is all the third parties that we work with primarily for our middle mile transportation services. So we do subcontract our air, uh, we work with rail providers, and we do have lots of subcontracted suppliers that help us with our, our middle mile heavy duty uh, vehicles. Another big area for us is our fuel and energy related emissions. 
So this is really the emissions related to the upstream production and distribution of all the fuel that we use in our network. So lots of opportunity for us here as we move to electric vehicles and, and we're moving away from the use of diesel and gasoline. The other big area for us as well, which is a little bit harder to tackle, is purchased goods and services and capital goods. So I think for many organizations, this is a this is a big area of their scope three emissions. And again, one that's a little bit harder to move the needle on. And then the final sources that we have within our, our scope three is related to business travel, employee commuting, as well as emissions related to the waste that we generate. So we have a lot of waste within our facilities in our operations. And this is again, another big focus for us at Purolator is diverting our waste from landfill and, and also reducing our waste. So there are emissions um, associated with this category as well. Well, thank you for that. Uh, I, I think it's quite interesting that so much of your emissions are directly or indirectly related to transport. It really speaks to what you are as an operation and perhaps is different to, to many a manufacturing company or a financial services company. And I think it speaks to the point that you made earlier of understanding where those emissions are so that you can actually do something about them and move the dial. Yeah. Dave? Yeah, it's pretty fortuitous for our listeners in Canada. About 24% of the GHG emissions does come from the transportation sector. So the fact that Pure Later is going after that, uh, you know, and have been for years is a tell tell sign of what opportunities there are. And uh, and I think other organizations will, will want... It's one of the... I'm going to say this, even though it might sound a little, it's one of the easier things to do on the transportation side versus looking at uh, your building infrastructure and things of that nature. It's So we'll, we'll, that's one of the comments I have. So here's the question for you, Cindy and, and Chris. So, you know, what are the targets that Purolator wants to achieve to, to or meet by 2030? Can you share with our audience what that would be? Sure, happy to. So... For us right now, I would say, you know, our North Star is is our ambition to get to net zero by 2050. So this is really, you know, where we started from. And then we tried to figure out, okay, where do we go from here? How ambitious do we need to be? What interim targets do we need to set to make sure that we're on the right pathway to get to net zero by 2050? So where we turned to from there was really looking at science-based targets and and, you know, we're working with the Science-Based Targets Initiative to help us understand, you know, how ambitious we need to be and what goals we need to set. So the first one that we've set is related to our scope one and two emissions. So we have a 2020 baseline for this goal. And what we're working towards is reducing our scope one and two by 42% by 2030. So this puts us on the right pathway to get to net zero by 2050. The other one that we're currently working on uh, with the Science-Based Targets Initiative is our Scope 3 target. This one is we're working on sort of second to our Scope 1 and 2, really just because, you know, as we discussed earlier, Scope 1 and 2 is more within our direct control. So we wanted to start there, make sure we're looking at our own operations and all the things that we can be doing within our operations to reduce emissions. And then now we're turning to Scope 3, and figuring out, okay, what does that goal need to be by 2030? And making sure that we also have a strong uh, work plan and roadmap to get there. So we, we have not yet uh, publicly released our goal, but we do anticipate it's going to be in the range of about 25% absolute reduction in scope three emissions that we need to achieve by 2030. So a big effort for us in 2024 is going to be putting together the detailed plan that will allow us to get to that goal. So, Cindy, you said something that probably tweaked John in my ears is you're talking about absolute. Most people just talk about intensity. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, people are scared of talking about absolute and you... And you're talking that that's quite a commitment. And the fact, uh, John mentioned this at the beginning, a lot of times people will say, we're going to do it by two, you know, 2050. And then there's no plan actually to execute it on every year. It's just, oh, we'll get there in 2050. So 
you've put steps and targets in place to ensure that you you actually will get to 2050, but you're you're doing things now. So that was kind of music to to my ears, John. What what did you think of hearing that? Like an absolute number. It's what it's got to be. If you're going to go SBTI, you've got to be talking, I think, absolute, because otherwise you're, you're getting a get out of jail car, you know, free card. You're going to go, oh, we're going to increase our business and increase our emissions. And there is an argument that's put forward that if you are more efficient in your emissions, you put out of business somebody who's less efficient. So there's a global benefit. But if we're going to hit global targets, we've all got to get round to thinking about absolute targets. Definitely. Yeah. And last point is that like we work with uh, financial institutions, they're still at intensity numbers. They haven't got to absolute numbers. They, we've been told that will happen shortly, but, but they still work on with intensity. So well done to Pure Later on that one. Okay, me next. Cindy, you mentioned about data and how important that is. And I think we have to put a, a, a disclaimer, or not perhaps a disclaimer. As a company, we are passionate about the fact that data drives transition. And it's really important. And if you're not measuring it, how the hell are you going to do anything with it? So... There's obviously a lot of data that has to be handled there. I wonder if you could talk us through the role that data management plays. And perhaps if you can tell us, you know, how do you collect that data? How do you process it? Is it just worked up, you know, bespoke workbooks or do you use a software platform? You know, if you any insight you could give us, I think would be interesting to us and also very interesting to our listeners. Sure, happy to. So, yeah, I, I would just start by saying data me measurement is, you know, is the most critical part of this. That's really where we started back a few years ago when we, you know, when we decided we were going to work towards net zero and we were going to establish some goals. You know, the very first place we started was looking at our data, figuring out how we could get the most accurate data available setting a very solid baseline to work from. And then also importantly, you know, having that baseline um, verified and audited by a third party. So this, this is something we've been doing every year since we set our 2020 baseline is, is working with a third party to review all of our emissions calculations and, and make sure that we're following the greenhouse gas protocol and that we're using the, the best methodologies possible in order to calculate our emissions. So I would say as, as you embark on this, again, go out and try and get the data. This is gonna come from many, many, many sources and is often very challenging to get. But again, this is an iterative process. So we have to start somewhere and each year we can continue to make improvements on the accuracy of the data. For us, we have to go out to all of our third party vendors, transportation partners to collect fuel and transportation related data from them. We also need to go out to all of our utility providers and, and collect that type of information. There's information we need to collect around our products and services, our, our waste in our facilities. So there's, there's a lot of different information that has to come together from many, many different sources in order to put together um, a solid uh, greenhouse gas inventory. For us right now, and I think for many companies, you know, we are still using, you know, Excel and some more basic tools to help us put this all together. But we are in the process right now of looking towards some other software and tools that can help us better, better execute on this. The, the challenges that we face right now is that our inventory is an annual process. So we work on our emissions inventory once a year. Where we would like to get to is to have this information um, available more frequently so that we know how we're progressing towards our goals. The other part of that, of course, is for our customers. 
So when our customers look for carbon reporting from us, that is essentially a slice of our overall emissions profile. So we need to be able to provide them with better and, and more accurate reporting as we go forward. So this is a this is a very important piece for us. It's something that we're we're focused on improving all the time and definitely looking for better solutions to help us report and understand our progress in real time. The other thing maybe I would turn it over to Chris is as it pertains to data is we are also looking at data related to our electrification program. And I know our fleet team is also collecting a lot of data to help us measure the the progress and the performance of our electric program. Yeah, correct, Cindy. And I think the you know the the, the data we're gathering now is is information that kind of leads into and builds up into all the information that that Cindy is collecting. And in, in some cases right now, we're actually having to build new KPIs and new baselines to take a look at the differences in our operation and in our fleet than, than previously run under, under ICE vehicles. So, mm. you know, we're having to measure things like the efficiency, but also the inefficiencies that we currently explore. And we have to baseline a lot of that. We're, again, we're coming up with some new metrics that we probably haven't had to, to look at before. Uh, you know, one that I think of right now is, is battery efficiency, battery degradation. You know, how are we going to measure that? That's going to be our key fuel measure. So I'll steal from Al Pacino on, every, on any given Sunday where we talk about the, the inches are all around us. And so now we're trying to figure out as we get into this, where are the opportunities for carbon reduction, for savings, for dollars now come from. And, you know, we, we, it's really driven by insights. And so we need all this data to really to drive the insights for us in terms of where we can become more efficient, less inefficient, and, and how that rolls up into our financials at the same time. So, you know, we, we have our, our current operating KPIs that we work with, but we have to augment them now. For as, as the fleet becomes electric, we have to augment them to, to a bit of a different reality. And, and we are creating new baselines as we speak. We're having to create uh, new measures. And that's the, that's the interesting thing, because we're, we're trying, is this right or is it wrong? Is it a good measure or is it a bad measure? Is it good data or is it bad data? We're, we're using devices in our vehicles. For us, it's a geotab device that, that records all, all of our measurements. And again, it's a question of, you know, data rich, information poor, what, what can we gather from it? So there is some of that learning again that's, that has to go on, that, that iterative component. But there's no question, as Cindy mentioned, that data is absolutely the key because this is the only way we're going to find out, you know, if we're getting better, how we can get better and where the opportunities uh, continue to present themselves. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, that resonates with us, definitely. Okay, I have probably the biggest question and probably the most difficult, and that is how does Pure Later plan to meet your targets? That's a big question. And so I know some of the stuff was talked about earlier, maybe even in this podcast in the first, but I don't know if Cindy or Chris, who wants to take a stab at that? Maybe it's a combination. How are you going to plan to do this? Well, I, I can tell you to begin with, this this all kind of it runs in hand in hand with our overall planning and target setting and goal setting process that we have as an organization. So we talked in our previous podcast about values, and this is also kind of one of our values in terms of how we plan, how we measure, how we measure ourselves. You know, we hold ourselves to a certain standard to to be able to go forward. So, and this is on a you know on a very you know high level view, but. We, we have a very robust planning process that we start with. And, you know, we, we, we go, we have an iterative process around target setting that gets us to, to where we need to get to. And we, you know, we have five-year plans, three-year plans and yearly plans. And we use that process to really kind of give us that reality check of where we're at. You know, what, what can we afford to do? What can't we afford to do? What's the priority? What's the current priorities? And obviously this, this project itself and this, this program, I should say, is an extremely high priority for, for a pure later, and it sits within our value chain of what we want to want to achieve. So I, I'll talk to, I'll let Cindy get more into the specific targets, but I, I think we have to use that as the background first to be able to get into what we need to do on a very specific level from a GHG program. And I think because we employ that, 
that gives us the advantage to be able to now to set specific targets on our GHG programs and how we want to move forward and, and helps us understand, uh, as I said, you know, capital, uh, human resources, uh, um, you know, the, the ability to, to deliver on the programs, what effort are we going to put into it? So that, that's the starting point. And again, we talked about also before about stakeholder management and alignment. And it really, it really starts from there. When we get that alignment from the top down, it then helps us begin to get into the specific targets from the GHG. And I'll, I'll, I'll let Cindy kind of go into that side of it now. Can, can I ask a quick question, Chris, on what you're saying? Is, it, is this transition becoming embedded in the corporation's strategic direction period as a company? Is it, is it part of the corporate strategy in totality? It's not a separate piece altogether. No, it's, it's part of our strategy. It's built in. I mean, this yeah. is... We have our, our, our president likes to talk about one team, one plan, and that, that's what it's all about. Okay, because I, I want to, just for our audience, a lot of times when people take on this initiative, this is a side piece that isn't even fed into the strategic yeah. direction of the organization. The fact that you said is it is part of the corporate strategy, that becomes more permanent versus mm -hmm. the flavor of the month or the year, you know? So uh, I think I just want to make, pick that up because I, that can be missed by some of our audience. Yeah, and, and on that point, I would say, you know, we we do have four pillars that make up our, our strategy, our corporate strategy. And again, similar to we talked about values, sustainability is is one of those pillars. So absolutely built into our core core strategy as an organization. So a couple things to add on here in terms of how we're going to get to our, our targets. We talked about a few minutes ago about data, and I just want to go back to the point that this has been so critical as we develop our roadmap and our plan to get to our targets is having that very detailed data available. Because what that's allowing us to do is to evolve our plan and change our plan as things are changing in the market, as our stakeholder needs are changing, as new technologies are, are coming online or, or ones that we were potentially counting on are, are having more challenges. So we're continuing to adjust our roadmap all the time, um, but it's very detailed in the sense that we know exactly what we need to do to get to the emissions reduction that will result in that goal. So for us, um, when we talk about our scope one and two goal, our 42%, this is this one we have a very detailed plan around. Um, we are going to be um, on-roading more than 3,000 last mile delivery vehicles uh, between now and 2030. We also have uh, currently have 50 electric tractors built into our plan. We're deploying renewable diesel at various locations across Canada where, where it is becoming available. So we've already done that in, out in BC. Three of our, our large terminals in BC are now using renewable diesel for their tractors. We're also hearing renewable electricity for all of our operations uh, between now and 2030. And, we, and we're looking to some other technologies like mobile carbon capture to, to also help us reduce emissions related to some of our heavy duty equipment. Another part of this, of course, is our buildings. So we've talked about this briefly, but focusing on energy efficiency in our buildings through HVAC and, and lighting replacements, also investigating solar for some of our facilities. So there's, there's quite a lot of things that have to go into this roadmap in order for us to get to the 42% by, by 2030. The goal that we talked about related to scope three. So some of the key areas for, the, for us there is related to optimizing our operations. So looking how we can optimize our, our routes in our, in our operations to be more efficient we're also going to see some great results there as we electrify our vehicles. So we'll be bringing down emissions related to the fuel use. And also we need to look at our air. So this is, we are having lots of conversations right now with uh, some of our air providers and they too are focused on the transition and, and how they're going to bring down their emissions. A big topic of conversation right now is uh, sustainable aviation fuel. 
So we do see this factoring into our into our 2030 goals as well as we work with our aviation partners to reduce. Well, thank you both for another great episode. To end this off, what advice would you give to a company starting a transition towards zero emissions? Well, for me, there's there's two pieces, and I'll and I'll reiterate the the from the first the first podcast was plan, 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 and give yourself time to plan. You know, you don't necessarily want to jump into this immediately and start you know jumping into to initiatives and 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 realize that they may not work. I, I think you you have to spend that time to understand. You know, as as, as Cindy said from the beginning understand what it is you need to do, where you want to go and how you need to get there. And then, and then work dynamically through your plans to work out how you're going to get there over a period of time. And, and I think the other part of that would also would be, uh, the other element I would say would be collaboration. And that's, you know, getting out and researching un- and understanding the marketplace. The, the one thing that, that, as I said previously too, there are so many people now involved in this industry reach out to to other companies, reach out to, you know, consultants if you have to, reach out to third parties, to, you know, nonprofit groups to understand a little bit more about the industry and the dynamic. Because as I said, it's changing all the time and, and there's lots of information out there that will help you inform your plan and how you may want to go specifically with your organization. And, you know, in some respects, it, it may be, you know, information overload, but I think that's a better place to start to gain more information before you just jump down the path, because uh, it could be a very expensive path to go down. So you just need to understand what, what's going to work best for your organization, for your capabilities. And, you know, it's, it's, as I say, how do you eat the elephant, you know, one bite at a time and, and, and do that you know, one bite at a time to get there, because it, 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 these can be very ambitious goals and you can find yourself, you know, disappointed very early on if you're not achieving them. But through that iterative planning process and speaking to others, I think it'll help inform those to try and get to a better result. Thanks for that, Chris. Cindy, what advice would you give to a company starting this transition? So I, I would just go back to, again, the, you know, all the conversation we've had around, you know, understanding your emission sources and, and making sure that you measure them. You, you need to know where you're starting from before you can go forward. So even if the data that you're collecting, you know, is not as accurate as you would like it to be, you need to start somewhere and you need to start having conversations with all your stakeholders around collecting this data and having this data available to inform your decisions. The second point I would make is around setting short term goals. So I think it's great, you know, many of us have these long term 2040 or 2050 goals. But it's important that we have short term goals and we have an action plan to get to those short term goals. So look for opportunities where you can get the deep emission cuts earlier on in your plans and and just make sure that you're setting targets for yourself that align with your longer term strategy. Thanks, Cindy. Dave, what advice would you give to a company starting this transition? I think talking to people like PureLater that are actually undertaking the process and have been for a while, it's invaluable information, right? It's mm-hmm. they're, they're coming from a perspective, from a customer's perspective, which is really helpful. So, you know, that is a big must. And I'm hopeful people listening to these podcasts will actually learn a lot from that. And then continue to read and learn and talk to different people in their, in whether it's suppliers or things of that nature, but you, you do, you got to act too. you got to plan and you got to start executing critical part. Thanks, Dave. And John, sorry to make you last. I'm sure it's difficult. I'm going to take two bites at this cherry because I'm going to, one is a bit of a takeaway and I'm picking up on something that Dave referred to about transport versus buildings. And I think it's just worth thinking about. I, I would suspect this, statistic is the same for North America as it is for Europe but we replace buildings at a rate of about one percent a year so it would take a hundred years to replace all the building stock with super efficient buildings we replace vehicles how often two three five years so the ability to make a, a big change there is really important and it's worth thinking about that you have got this opportunity and you've got a number of cycles at which you can do it. 
And then my advice on this transition, there's been so much valuable stuff said here, and I'm just going to go back. It, it's about data, but it's about making data into knowledge. So it's data to information to knowledge, and it's managing that pathway. It, will un it underpins business management. It underpins the transition. And it's how you prove what you're doing. It's how you see how well you're doing. It's how you show to other people how well you're doing, which is also important. Thanks for that, John. Well, thanks, Dave, John, Chris, and Cindy for another great episode. Been really Thank interesting. You Thank you all. Thank you. That's all for today's episode of the 360 on Energy and Carbon podcast. Thanks for listening. Make sure to check us out on our website at 360energy.net and follow us on LinkedIn at 360 Energy Inc. Tune in to our podcast on Apple Music, Spotify, Anchor, or other listening platforms by searching the 360 on Energy and Carbon. You can watch the video recording and subscribe on YouTube at 360 Energy Inc. Email us your feedback at podcast at 360energy.net or comment on our LinkedIn posts.